Where do you live? Where do you live in these days? You say, well, you don't want to ask that question. Everybody's shouting out their addresses. But where do you live in relationship to the Jordan River? Where do you live? Do you live on the east side of the Jordan River or do you live on the west side of the Jordan River? Now, many of you, you know your geography well enough to know that you live on the west side of the, of the Jordan River. We don't live on the east side of the Jordan River. But where do you live spiritually? Spiritually, do you live on the east side of the Jordan River or do you live on the west side of the Jordan River? This morning, that's a very important question for us to give consideration to. And uh, I hope that today you'll allow the Lord to just really speak to your heart about where you're living. The title of the message this morning is Living Near But Not In God's Will. And I submit to you, uh, based upon Scripture and based upon observation, but based upon primarily the Word of God, and the confessions of people, the real data, I'm afraid there's a whole lot of folks who claim Jesus as the Savior and the Lord of their life, and they're not living in the plan and purposes of God. I just believe with all of my heart that that's true. I'm not an alarmist, but I think I am a realist, and I believe that that's uh, where we are. We're looking this morning at a text in the book of Numbers. We're looking at the 32nd chapter of Numbers, and we'll be looking at the various verses there, particularly the first few verses, but actually the, the historical narrative, we're going to be dealing with the, the main content of, of that text and uh, focusing in on what we have before us here in this passage. Let me set the stage for you. Numbers 32, okay, we're getting toward the end of Numbers. The Hebrews are getting ready, finally, to go on over in the Promised Land. And guess where they are? They're on the east side of the Jordan River. All right? So that's where they were. They were on the east side of the Jordan River. The plan of God was for them to cross the Jordan River and move into the land of the Canaanites on the west side of the Jordan River. That's what God had told Abraham many, many years back, right? He would bring them into that land. He would bless them. He would make them a mighty nation. He would bless those who would bless them. He would curse those who would curse them. And in them, all the people of the earth would be blessed. Of course, that prophecy was ultimately fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ, who, of course, was a, a Jewish man, descendant of Abraham. And in Jesus, the nations of this world are blessed. And so God had made that promise to Abraham. He renewed that promise to the patriarchs. He declared that promise to Moses. He told Moses that he was going to use Moses to bring the Egyptians out of their years of slavery and bondage in Egypt. That he would bring them into that land flowing with milk and honey. And he would establish them there as his people for his glory. Right? That's what God had so strongly communicated to Moses. And Moses had strongly communicated that to the Israelites as their leader. They've wandered in the wilderness now for some 40 years. They had been poised, ready to go over to the promised land. And a committee, you can always get in trouble, or you can sometimes get in trouble when you appoint committees. And so they appointed this committee of 12. And uh, these 12 spies went over into Canaan, went into the promised land, saw all the great blessings of the land there, but they came back. And only Joshua and Caleb said, we're going, and, and, and here's what's in the land, and, and God's called us to go, and, and so let's, let's go. Ten of the twelve said they're giants of the land. We're like grasshoppers before them. We can't do this thing, Moses. The people's hearts were discouraged, and the result was the judgment of God came on them, and all of those over 20 years of age died off in the wilderness, except for Joshua and Caleb, because they were the two that came back with a positive report. So 40 years of wandering in the wilderness and the dying off of the people had taken place. And now, here they are again on the east side of the Jordan River, ready to go into the promised land, ready to fulfill the plan and the purpose of God as a nation, to go in there and be settled and to take ownership of that land and to be a missionary people so that the world would be blessed through them. And here comes some representatives 
from the Gadites, uh, the tribe of, of Reuben, the Reubenites, and the Gadites, and uh, some representatives from Manasseh. But here in, in, in the beginning, we find just the, the Gadites and, and the uh, and the Reubenites are, are there. And they tell Moses, Moses, we don't want to go. We, we like what we see around about us. We've got a bunch of cows, Moses. And we see all around us this land that God subdued in front of us. It's grassy. I mean, this is good pasture land, Moses. We've got our cows and we've got green grass. We want to just stay right here. Moses, and we're going to read it in just a moment. Moses, don't make us go. Don't make us go. They're forgetting some things. It wasn't Moses who was making them go. It was God who was making them go. And they're missing out on this. That was their land of inheritance. God had redeemed them from Egypt to take them into that land so that they would be that one nation of people, God's special people that could touch this world for the glory of God. And so they had a wonderful privilege and divine assignment to go into the land of Canaan and become the nation of Israel in that land and God's people and God's people on mission. But they had some cows. We've got a bunch of cows, Moses. And all around the us, you see all this green grass, Moses? We kind of like it on the east side of the Jordan River. I believe with all of my heart, sadly so, that there is a tremendous parallel between those Israelites of, of uh, the tribes of Reuben and Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh we're going to see in just a little bit. There's a tremendous parallel between them and what they said and what they did and with many people today who profess to be Christians. There is a sad but very clear parallel between that major group of Israelites and so many today whose names are upon the rolls of our churches. You see, God has not called us to go across literally the Jordan River and occupy the land west of the Jordan River. He's not called us to that. But you know what He has done? He has called us into a spiritual land. He has called us to occupy a spiritual land. He's called us to occupy a spiritual land of worship. God has called us to be His people who worship Him in spirit and in truth. Jesus said to the woman of the well there in John chapter 4, that the hour has come and now is. That they that worship must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And the Father seeks us to worship Him. God has called us into the spiritual land of, of, of being real disciples of Jesus. Real followers of Christ. Jesus said, follow me. Come and follow me. And so we follow Jesus and grow in His likeness. The Scripture says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, that we are to grow in the grace of and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Ephesians tells us that we are to grow up in Jesus. And so we are to be following Jesus. We are His disciples. We are the Lord's apprentices. And we follow after Jesus so that we can be like Him. The Lord Jesus Christ has saved us so that we might know the Word of God and apply the Word of God to our lives. The Scripture says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 15, that we are to discipline ourselves. That we are to study, to show ourselves approved unto God. God's workmen who don't need to be ashamed because we rightly interpret and apply the word of truth. The Bible tells us that we're not just to be hearers of the word. James chapter 1 verse 22. But we are to be doers of the word. The Bible tells us that we are God's redeemed people and that we are one body of believers and that Jesus Christ is our head and that we are His body and we live in that spiritual realm of being God's functioning church. And we pray for one another and we encourage 
with one another. And we unite together in our spiritual gifting and we serve the Lord together. And we do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as Hebrews chapter 10 tells us. But rather, we come together and we encourage one another and we help motivate one another. And so much the more as we see that our time is running out, that the day is approaching. We are God's people. And we've been called to that spiritual land. Spiritual living is our, is our life and our calling. But you know what? There are a lot of folks who've named the name of Jesus that have got a problem. You know what their problem is? They've got some cows. And they like the green grass. And so they're just not really interested in worshiping God in spirit and truth. Investing themselves in the work of God in the church. Studying the word of God that they might be changed by the power of God's word. Getting on their knees before God in prayer and, and, and blessing the Lord and praising the Lord and seeking the Lord's guidance and direction for their lives. They're not living on the west side of the Jordan. They're not giving themselves to what they know has been clearly communicated in the Word of God as God's plan and purpose for Christians. They're just not there. Why? They've got some cows. And they like the green grass on the other side of the Jordan River. What do I see here in our text that tells me that there's a tremendous parallel here? Or what are some specifics that I see here in Numbers chapter 32 that, that uh, we tragically see today being lived out among so many of the people of God? The first one is this. We see that they allow the blessings of God to become the cause for their disobedience. They allow God's blessings to become the cause of their disobedience. And I tell you, we see the same thing today. Because God has blessed people. Because God has blessed them with things. And with some people, God has, has blessed them with money. And God has blessed them with health. And God has blessed them with time. And so they use those things in temporary ways, with temporary ends. Instead of serving the Lord and, and living for God like they should, they're all focused upon the cows that God has blessed them. Look at the text, beginning in verse 1 of Numbers 32. The Reubenites and Gadites had a very large number of livestock. Where did they get their livestock? You know, it was from the Lord. That's where they got their livestock and every other good thing that came in your life. Every good thing in your life came from the hand of God. I mean, if it's worth having, God allowed you to have it. it it's the blessings of the Lord. God's good hand upon your life. That's what's brought the good things of God into, into your living and into, into your lifestyle. I, I remind you, this this is a nomadic people and they've been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And they've been in conflict and they've been in war. They've been in battle. And the Bible tells us that God had given them manna from heaven every day. And God at times had given them some quail for their dinner table, right? And God even gave them water out of a rock. So where do you think the cattle came from? It was the good hand of God that had blessed them with, with the, those calves, with, the, with that cow. And so they had a very large number of livestock. When they surveyed the land of Jazer and Gilead, they saw that the region was a good one for livestock. So the Gadites and Reubenites came to Moses, Eliezer, the priest, and the leaders of the community and said, The territory of Adaroth and Dibon and Jazer and Nimrod and Heshbon and Eliela and Seban and Nebo and Baian, which the Lord struck down before the community of Israel. See, they're even acknowledging that God is the one who cleared the land for them. The Lord struck down all of this opposition uh, before the community of Israel. And it's a good land for livestock. And your servants owned livestock like Moses didn't know anything about that. And then verse 5, they said, if we have found favor in your sight. Oh, listen to the carnality. 
If we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants as a possession. Don't make us cross the Jordan. If we found favor in your sight, Moses, would you just leave us alone here? Would you just let us be? We like it over here. And look, God cleaned this land out for us. And look at all the grass all around about us. You just see grass, 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 grass. And so sure, sure. I tell you what, you get in trouble when you walk away the clearly communicated message of God's Word. God had told them that's not where they were supposed to live. God had told them they were to cross the Jordan River and go into the Promised Land. God had told them they were to settle the land of the Canaanites. And now they're even blaming God. They said, God cleared this land out for us. And it's a grassy land. So obviously this is just the blessing of God. Does it sound familiar to you? People will get focused upon their earthly possessions, their earthly things. And those things will so distract them from spiritual life and mission and church and service and ministry and growing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, God's the one that blessed me with that boat. God's the one who, who blessed us with the ability to play these sports. God's the one who gave me my second job. God's the one who did this. And God's the one who did that. So I don't have the time to pray like I ought to. And it's God's fault. I don't have the time to read my Bible like I ought to. Because it's God's fault. Because you know He wants me to use that camera. You know, it's, it's God's fault. I've got all this green grass and I've got all this cattle. And so God's just going to have to understand that this is the way it's going to have to be. The blessings of God became the very cause of their disobedience to God. And if we're not real careful, we'll allow what God has blessed us with to take us away from living in the spiritual land that God has called us to. We will allow those blessings from God to keep us away from fulfilling the plan and purpose of God. Listen, it's not stuff that you need to be focused on. It's God and what God has told us is Christian living and it's those things that have eternal value. That must be our focus. Second. Not only do we see here that they allowed the blessings of God to cause their disobedience, but notice with me this. Notice that their decision would negatively influence others. Whenever you choose to not really go after the Lord and to follow Him in your life and to grow in prayer and study and in worship and to be involved in the ministry, the mission of the church, Whenever you make that choice, listen, you negatively influence the lives of other people. Carnality is contagious. And when we're not going after God and the things of God the way that we should, then we will not be the inspiration to others. And instead of being the inspiration to others that we ought to be, and the encouragement to others that we ought to be, instead we become a discouraging presence to others. A discouraging presence. Look at verse 6. You see, they would, they would discourage the other tribes. Moses asked the Gadites and the Reubenites, Should your brothers go to war while you stay here? I'll tell you something this morning, folks. God's people have always been in spiritual war. We've always been toe-to-toe -to -toe with the devil. God's church has always been under attack. The work of God has always been the target of Satan. And Christian people and the glory of God in the life of Christians has always been what Satan has tried to mess up. So we're at war. Don't you dare sit down under the oak tree on the other side of the Jordan River. We need you in the battle. You're needed you're needed to be in rank with God's people, serving alongside. We need to encourage each other and pray for one another and unite together that we might touch our community and world for the Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot, we cannot 
but be negatively affected if you do not join with us in war. So he says, why should your brothers go to war while you stay over here? Why are you discouraging the Israelites from crossing into the land the Lord has given them? That's what your fathers did when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to see the land. And he's referring back to those 12 tribes, those 12 spies that I told you about earlier. Joshua and Caleb, all the ones coming back with a positive report. And then the people perishing in the wilderness because they were discouraged by the report of those spies. Moses said, you're getting ready to do the same thing that was done before. Now, it's not going to be on the screen for you, but, but listen to verse 14 and, and 15. And if you've got your Bible, you can just see it there, but listen to it. And hear you, a brood of sinners. Now, that, that would win a whole lot of friends for Moses, wouldn't it? And hear you, a brood of sinners, stand in your father's place, adding even more to the Lord's burning anger against Israel. He says, you're making God mad. You're not wanting to, to move fully into the plan of God. You're making God mad. You're causing the anger of God to burn against His people. If you turn back from following Him, He will once again lead this people in the wilderness and you will destroy all of them. If you discourage the hearts of, of our other Israelites, then you're going to end up bringing us everyone into ruin all over again. We're just going to have history repeating itself here. I tell you what's the greatest tragedy of all. And men, are you listening to me? Parents, ladies, are you listening to me? Here's the greatest tragedy of all. You see, you're not being a man of prayer or a woman of prayer. You're not being a, a person who gives. And you're not being a person who is faithful in worship and service. And you're not joining with us in mission and ministry in our community and world. You're not really being on board and really invested in the spiritual land of Christian life and living. Listen to me. It not only affects the church, but you are greatly, negatively affecting your family. And not only your immediate family, but the family to come. The family to come. Our life right now and where we are spiritually right now is affecting our children and to come grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren. We set the stage now for what's coming after us. And if, and if dad doesn't pray, then why should I? If dad only goes to church once or twice a month, then why should I go to church as an adult more than once or twice a month? If dad doesn't tithe, then why should I tithe? If, if dad wasn't involved in ministry, then why should I be involved in ministry? If living on the east side of the Jordan River was okay for mom and dad, then why is it not okay for me? You see what happens when you choose to live on the east side of the Jordan River? Notice it here in our text in verse 16. Then they approached him and said, We want to build sheepfolds here. Okay, here on the east side of Jordan. For our livestock and cities for our dependents. But we will arm ourselves and be ready to go ahead of the Israelites until we have brought them into their place. All right, Moses, we'll, we'll concede. We'll go over into Canaan and we'll We'll fight and help you possess the land there. But that's not going to be what we're going to do for ourselves. We're only going to help you out of obligation. Just obligation. We're not committed to this thing. We don't plan on living over there with you. But we'll go all over there, if you put it that way. Because we don't want God mad at us. And so we're going to compromise. Because God doesn't get mad at compromisers, does he? Don't you mishear me but we will arm ourselves and be ready to go ahead of the Israelites until we have brought them into their place. Meanwhile, our dependents will remain in the fortified cities. I want to tell you something. When, when you step out of harmony with God, I don't care how fortified your city is. It's not fortified. Our dependents will remain in the fortified cities. They were setting their children in a position to be vulnerable to the attacks of their enemies. Our dependents will remain in the fortified cities because of the inhabitants of land. We know that, that, that there's danger over here. So we're going to put them behind some good walls, Moses. 
We will not return to our homes until each of the Israelites has taken possession of his inheritance. And oh, look at verse 19. Yet we will not have an inheritance with them. We're not going to live in that land, Moses. We're not going to have an inheritance with God's people on the west side of the Jordan. We will not have an inheritance with them across the Jordan and beyond because our inheritance will be across the Jordan to the east. And then verse 25, the Gadites and Reubenites answered Moses, your servants will do just as my Lord commands. No, we're just like Moses as their leader is commanding them. But, but look at verse 26, our children, our wives, our livestock, and all of our animals will remain here in the cities of Gilead. Dad, don't you leave your children on the east side of the Jordan. Mom, don't you leave your children. Don't you leave your grandchildren on the east side of the Jordan. You get your family and you get over there in the spiritual land God's called you to. You move your household in where God has called your household to. Don't you dare leave your children out of the land of spiritual life and blessing and promise. You take them where God wants them. You say, well, how did this all end up? Well, let's just go there. Let's go there. Their decision, I've already told you, will make them vulnerable to their enemies. Well, when you make yourself and your family vulnerable to Satan, he will not miss out on the opportunity. Destruction and ruin will absolutely come. And your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren will never become all that they could have been if you don't help them get there where they need to be. In 1 Chronicles chapter 5, we're going to skip forward. We're going to hop in our, in our uh, time machine and we're going to run forward 150 years, okay? 150 years later, 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verses 23 through verse 26, the sons of half the tribe of Manasseh, before now it's just been mentioned the Reubenites and the Gadites, but now you've got half the tribe of Manasseh here also identified as being those who did not want to go. The sons of half the tribe of Manasseh settled in the land from Bashan to Bel Haran, uh, Hermon rather, that is uh, Sinir or Mount Hermon. They were very numerous. Uh, there's the listing of the heads of those houses in, in verse 24. Uh, the latter part of verse 24 says they were brave warriors, famous men, and heads of their patriarchal families. Sounds pretty good. So it didn't turn out for them so badly after all, did it? Oh, don't you quit reading there. Look at verse 25. But they were unfaithful to the God of their ancestors. Who set that in motion? Their dads, their grandparents did. They said that in motion. They were unfaithful. Why? Dad was unfaithful. They could be unfaithful. They didn't, their, their fathers and grandfathers and mothers and grandmothers, they didn't take God seriously and, and do fully the will of God and, and, and pursue God like they should have in their life. And so, why was it such a big deal for them? They were unfaithful to the God of their ancestors. They prostituted themselves with the gods of the nations God had destroyed before them. So the God of Israel put it into the mind of Pul, that is tiglath pileser king of Assyria, to take the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh into exile. And I tell you what, it wasn't an easy journey for it wasn't a trip to Six Flags or Disney. It was with terrible invasion and the loss of life, the shedding of blood. It was a military campaign. And God did it. God did it. God put it into the heart of the Assyrian king to go after the Reubenites and the Gadites and have the tribe of Manasseh. And when the Assyrian captivity took place, those two and a half tribes were the first ones to be carried out. Why? Cows. 
cows and grass, not willing to go fully after God, not willing to fulfill the plan and purpose of God for them. Moses, we got some cows. And look at all this grass. God's blessed us. We don't need to go over there. Moses, don't make us go. I'll tell you, there's a sad but very real parallel between those folks of our text and so many today in the name, the name of Jesus. They're not living in the land of spiritual life. They're not living in the land of worship, the land of church life and ministry. They're not living in the land of spiritual growth and development. They're not living in the Word of God and in prayer. They're not seeking to be genuine followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're living on the east side of the Jordan River. And what's so sad is, they're not living there by themselves. They've got their families there with them. I beg you today, if you're camped out on the east side of the Jordan, would you please get up? And would you move over into the land that God has called you to? Not only for your good, but for the good of the Christian church and the good of your family. Would you do it today? And would you do it for the glory of God? Let's stand.